Welcome to the Purpose-Based Retirement with Certified Financial Planner, Casey Weed. Casey is the president of Howard Bailey Financial. Whatever risk you face during your retirement years, we've got a plan. A published author and radio host. It's not how much we make during the good times, it's how much we keep during those really bad times. His advocacy for retirees and pre-retirees has made him a sought-after speaker and trusted financial leader. And putting a real plan together. This is the Purpose-Based Retirement. Good to see you again. I am Lee Kelso here with Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson, Certified Financial Planners from Howard Bailey Financial. On our program today, we're going to start with a simple question. How much time do you spend on finances? Now, you might answer that question probably less than I should, but this is one of those situations where less can actually be more if you do it wisely. So, so let's jump off there, Casey. Yeah, you know, and a lot of these things that we're going to talk about here come from my own personal experiences and, and mistakes that I've made in the past that I found I was spending more time on my money than really enjoying uh, what I had worked so hard for. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I want to share some of these different things that I think can affect you no matter what point in your uh, financial life that you're in, whether you're in the accumulation stage or the retirement stage or the deaccumulation stage. You know, take really note of each one of these individual things and some of them may seem very obvious however you can garner a lot of value from looking at the obvious from time to time all right well let's get started with a simple one and that is spend less now if i'm are you saying i'm going to spend less time tracking my right. transactions well exactly and i said we were going to start with something obvious yeah. right and this is probably the most obvious is to begin to spend less money and now if we dig a little bit deeper in that and talk about well what happens when we spend less money? Well, we end up spending less time researching uh, different items we should buy, giving away those different items after they've, they're no longer a use, servicing those different things, maintaining our properties. If you have a 20 acre property, you got a pond, you got a creek, you got your pool, you got all these different things that you have to maintain and work on. You know, that's spending money. The same thing goes for vacations. If you want to plan a vacation or if you want to go on vacation you have to spend time planning and maybe you actually don't enjoy that time spending hunting for hotels and looking for rental cars just simplifying your life also means that you're gonna have less money left over at the end of every month yeah and, and I then think, you just shift that over to your emergency fund yeah and some, somewhere my mom's laughing right now because when I was a kid I would go to three or four stores before I would settle on a pair of shoes right so you spend all that extra time bouncing around it's it's wasteful time plus Casey as you mentioned maintaining storing cleaning all the things that come along with the excess uh, stuff that we have and so Lee I think we can we have this wealth of information at our fingertips but sometimes it can be counterproductive to what's really important. I've seen some of the happiest retirees. I mean, my dad would be one of those. I mean, he had all this real estate you know, as he was getting on his way to retirement. He owned a couple businesses. He had several different properties all over the country. And he had all these different headaches. And he just liquidated everything. Uh -huh. yeah, I moved everything in the guaranteed income streams, bought a small house uh, down in the mountains in North Carolina. And, and he just enjoyed himself yeah, and spent time really doing the things that mattered most to him and you know part of that was spending less yeah, and that's it's, nice. a, it's a return on life rather than the return on, on investment so another strategy is to keep more of your assets in cash now I assume you mean not necessarily keep a lot of cash around but yeah. have your investments in cash. Sure, I mean, it might be money market in your brokerage account, or it might be your checking account, it might be your savings account, but just increasing those cash balances a little bit can even simplify your life, even if we're just talking about checking for a minute, instead of having $5,000 in your checking at all time, maybe it's $15,000 in checking. So when that $5,000 expense comes along, you don't have to worry about transferring funds from saving or tra liquidating investments or to make that purchase. You know it's there, you make the purchase, and you move on with your life. There's a lot to be said about having additional cash. You know, the only reason that you're, and think about this, why does your financial advisor, why is your investment advisor emphasize so much that you need to stay invested 100% at all times? Is that for your benefit or is that for the advisor's benefit? You know, think about the smart money. You know, right now, corporations have the highest cash balances in history. We've right. never seen cash balances this high. That's because that's the smart money. And the smart money is waiting on the the 
investor who's holding on to the real estate, the business, the stocks and bonds that's been staying fully invested. They're waiting on that opportunity to take advantage of you when the market does downturn. And, and, and it will happen. Sure. And now, do you want to be the smart money sitting on some additional cash to take advantage of those opportunities and not worry about those things? Or do you want to be the one that's left holding the bag? sitting on $230 billion in cash or whatever that number is. So I think the other point there is we see a lot of retirees that are spending an awful lot of time watching the accounts every day, watching yeah. the stock positions. Well, what happens is when markets are coming down, if they're scrambling to figure out what they need to buy or sell or rebalance, the reality is if you're keeping a cash reserve, you can just worry about the buy side. You don't have to worry about the sell side so much. So freeing up that extra mental uh, mental capacity to be able to make smart decisions rather than scrambling, I think yeah. is important. And another good tip, I think this one makes a lot of sense for, for a lot of us, and that is hire a professional. Yeah. Well, we want to spend our time again, like Marshall said, it's it's about return on life at mm -hmm. some point. And, and maybe it costs you a little extra to work with a financial professional. Yeah, but many times it doesn't. You know, we have a lot of people that walk into our offices that are all invested in mutual funds and they're paying one and a half to two percent a year. They don't see those fees or expenses, but they're paying those fees inside those funds. They can come in, get professional help, dramatically reduce their cost of investing, and now they've got somebody that's there to guide those things along so they don't have to worry about rebalancing on a regular basis or looking at your portfolio's performance every month, every day, worrying if we should be buying Coke or selling Pfizer. And now you've moved those things onto a professional so that you can spend time doing the things that you love most. Mm -hmm. You didn't work those whole your whole life and your accumulation years saving and trying to get to this point where you step into retirement. You have this big nest egg and now you're worrying about the market on a day-to-day -day basis. Should we be buying this stock or selling this stock? What about our income? We've got to watch our budget. We've got to watch our expenses. What about our taxes? Are we paying too much in taxes? Let's really enjoy what we work so hard for. And sometimes that requires hiring a professional, an investment professional, a tax advisor, maybe an attorney for that matter, or a whole team, depending on your level of investable assets. And if you've got very confusing situations, confusing tax situations, stock buyouts, selling property, selling businesses, you may spend, if you're a do it yourself, or you may spend several hours trying to research search the tax code when that time could have been better spent somewhere else. And that, that kind of comes back to working with a financial professional in automating the reviews. I think that takes a lot of, of uh, weight off of somebody's shoulders when they know that they're coming in every quarter. They don't have to yeah. think about rebalancing. And that's another thing that we talk about, Lee, is automating things to simplify our lives, whether that's bills, uh, mortgage yeah. payments, automating to simplify or just our contributions time. for that matter automate sure. lump simplify those things you know that could be your 401k you can automate your 529 allocation so it comes out of your check every month or it comes directly out of the bank every month it's being reinvested into a set asset allocation mix and from time to time you can lump some of those dollars into your investments they don't have to necessarily go equally into every single opportunity that's out there they can be directed in lump sums from time to time and I think simplify is a huge one again especially for retirees no matter where we're at we want to simplify our financial life but as we get closer to those retirement years what becomes in focus I mean, we've seen people time after time walk into our office and maybe this is you you know that you have 30 different investment accounts or 40 or 50 I see people with over 50 different account numbers mm. time and time again and where does that leave your family? Where does that leave your spouse? Oftentimes, one spouse isn't concerned because they know exactly what and where each one of those individual accounts are, but what if something happens to you? Where does that leave your spouse? Or for that matter, what happens if something happens to both of you? Now your kids, do they want to be picking up three, four, five different accounts mm -hmm. and consolidating or having to run around consolidating investments from different brokers from all over the country? And you can have a very sound, financial plan that's very simple with three to five accounts regardless of your investable assets and stay diversified following key principles of finance. You know, I just uh, read an article the other day about weaning yourself off of micromanaging your financial assets mm -hmm. and this author's point was as you step back, take that time that you would have played around the margins and dinked in your own accounts 
and build that legacy file so that your heirs and your relatives have yeah. all of that information well documented. Put your time into that instead, it's more meaningful. Yeah. It's so great when our clients get to leave our office after we've went through the process of interviewing and establishing a strategy, implementing the plan and delivering that written plan where now they've got instructions for not just themselves on the rest of the retirement years and what the expectations are for each one of those accounts, but they've got instructions that are going directly to their beneficiaries on what each one of those accounts are and what they're going to accomplish and how they're going to transfer in the most tax efficient way. They've got a nice box. It's all in there from liquidity, income, growth, estate planning. Their whole purpose-based retirement is in this nice box that they can pull out at any time and know exactly where they stand and where they're headed. And that's what retirees deserve. Well, I think that's a great idea, a good topic to start the program with, and it brings us to this. We have a special offer for the next 10 people to call right now. We're offering a complimentary financial review of your entire financial and retirement plan. It's an opportunity to get an education about your money so that you can make the very best decisions possible moving forward. So for the next 10 callers, Casey and his team will make time on the calendar to sit down and visit with you and give you your very own purpose-based retirement. We are right back with questions from viewers in just a minute. When you have confidence in your retirement future, you can live the life you've always imagined. Because of planning, you now have time to reflect on the wonderful memories of your life. You and your spouse finally have the luxury of leisure time together. To spend fun times with your grandkids, sharing the joy of their excitement about life. Smiling at the thought of quality time with your children and of picking up the check. At last, you have time to breathe and rekindle the love of your life. Why? Because you imagined what could be. You planned for retirement. So today, you own your future. You need a plan for retirement to create the lifestyle you've always dreamed of. The first step is to tune into the Purpose Based Retirement Radio Hour with your hosts, Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson, every Saturday morning at 11 and Sunday afternoon at 1 on 1190 WoWo and 1075 FM. During the week, Casey gets uh, questions via email. We filter through those, pick out a few, and then bring them to you here on the program. We invite those callers to join us. And the first one today is Connie from Fort Wayne. Connie, go right ahead. For a physician who has a Roth, a 403, 401k, 457, taxable brokerage account, what is the optimal withdrawal strategy? Which comes first? Wow, Connie, hey, that's a great question, and you're thinking about the right things. That's what I want you to focus on. You're talking about tax buckets, and when we're talking about taxable accounts versus uh, 457s, ta that qualified tax bucket versus the Roth, we're talking about how those dollars become taxable. And I can tell you, I wish there was a one-size-fits-all answer, Connie, but it really kind of depends on what your other income streams are, whether you're married filing jointly, whether you're a single filer. So we can get into a little bit more strategy, but I think the textbook Book, Casey would say that we withdraw from our uh, tax-free stuff first and defer those taxes on the qualified accounts as long as possible. But I'm a little pessimistic about where taxes are going to yeah. go. So I may be starting withdrawals from those qualified accounts first. But Connie, this, this certainly warrants a much deeper conversation because there is a lot of tax implications, right? Yeah, and this isn't a thing that we find that's unusual with the physicians that we work with, because physicians often often go from hospital to hospital, maybe working for the VA for a while, you ended up with your 457, you end up with all these different accounts, your 401k, 403b, 457, and I think the first step for you, Connie, is to consolidate and simplify. And so in order to simplify, we can take those 401ks, 403bs, 457s, you know, we can take the Roth 401ks, consolidate all the Roths, consolidate all the 401ks, so we've got our tax-deferred bucket, our tax-free bucket, 
bucket and our taxable bucket. So now we've got three levels. It's very easy to see, and now we can begin to structure the actual income plan. As 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 Marshall stated, you know, typically if we open up the textbook, the Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards, it's going to share with us and say that we need to spend those taxable dollars first, those accounts that have already been taxed. Then we're going to spend our tax deferred dollars, and lastly, we're going to spend the tax free or the Roth dollars. Now, there's been some good research out there and studies that have shown that one of the best strategies would be to blend those tax deferred accounts with the taxable accounts in order to maintain a tax bracket. Now, what we see quite often with physicians, though, is we have these huge 401ks and 403b balances, and those balances dwarf a lot of the other accounts that have been established over the years because you've been in these high income earning years and trying to de defer as much as you possibly can in those high tax brackets. And now with those huge balances that you're going to have in those 401ks or IRAs, you have to be careful of not deferring those things out too far because then you run into a required minimum distribution problem. Now those balances just keep growing and now you may be in a very high tax bracket in the future as a result of those required minimum distributions. A good strategy we often use for physicians is to spend the taxable accounts and in the meantime we're going to convert those tax deferred accounts, those 401ks, et cetera, to Roth IRAs, max out those tax brackets, and then we'll use a blended income strategy once we get to 70 and a half and we reach RMD stage. And so those are some of the different things you need, to, you need to think about. And I think just from that answer, you can tell there's a lot that goes into this. It's not as simple as opening up the textbook, especially when you have that many different accounts. Take your time and make sure you make the best possible decision for yourself moving forward. Wow, Connie, what a nice problem to have though, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not bad. Brandon from Manchester is up next on the program. Go right ahead. Should I get an annuity for a portion of all fixed expenses in retirement? If so, which type of an account should the money come from? Uh, when is the optimal time to get an annuity? Should I wait for a higher interest environment or do an annuity ladder? Should I split that annuity among different companies? Well, Brandon, that is an excellent question. We talk about fixed expenses, Casey, and one of the most important things to a retirement income plan is providing consistent, reliable income to know that our bills are paid. An annuity can be a good tool to accomplish that. There's an, uh, we don't have a long enough segment here. There's a lot of different types of annuities. We could go down a few different strategies here, but I think you're on the right track. And one thing that we want to do is, do we want to prepare for the worst or do we want to hope for the best with our investment strategy? And an annuity can provide some guarantees. There's a lot of different types of, of annuities. I'm focusing more on fixed annuities versus variable annuities, but there is good strategies there, Brandon, where you can take a chunk of your, your puzzle to, to send you the necessary income to pay those bills that you know you're going to have every day from, for the rest of your life. Yeah, I think having that confidence, I mean, those are the, mm -hmm. the, the retirees that have taken that step uh, to, to at, at least take care of those fixed expenses, you know, just those basic expenses you know you're going to have every single month for the rest of your lives, Social Security, pension, maybe take a small portion of the portfolio and create a guaranteed income stream from that enables you to take risk with more of the rest of the portfolio and sometimes actually create better returns over the long term because we have some of those guarantees and if nothing else now you have the peace of mind knowing that you're never going to run out of money and to some that's a very important piece of the puzzle but it's not for everybody somebody likes uh, sometimes people like to be cowboys and they enjoy the ups and downs and if the market's down you have a strategy maybe you have cash you've set aside for two or three or four years to make sure you don't have to sell out of those stocks and bonds and things like that uh, your other part of that question was where where does that money come from? Now, uh, we would typically, if we're going to annuitize a portion of the portfolio or set a piece of it into an annuity, that means we're going to tie it up. That's the downside of an annuity. We get some guarantees along with it, but we have those, those, those strings attached to the funds where there's penalties and we can't get to all of them at any given time, but we have that peace of mind. So where I would go with this is I would look for dollars that are already tied up in a sense. And your IRAs and 401ks, those are tied up dollars. Even though it may seem like you can go get them at any time, you're not going to go pull out $100,000, $500,000 out of an IRA, out of a 401k, because you're essentially going to have a penalty anyway in the form of a very large 
tax mm -hmm. and a higher tax bracket. So those dollars were originally created to be for retirement income, to slowly draw those things out over time, and an annuity is a great way to do that, maybe with a portion of those funds. Um, do we have any other pieces of that well, question I, we need to answer? I think part of it is kind of, there's a lot of folks today that are just trying to recreate the pensions of old. A lot of baby yeah. boomers today don't have pensions, so they're looking to carve out sure. a chunk and create their own pension. Maybe it's $750 a month, maybe it's $1,500 a month. It's not meant, no, no one investment vehicle is perfect for everything. Sure. I don't want everything in stocks, I don't want everything in annuities. Yeah. Blend a plan that, that provides sure. for this. And these last things. couple questions there, should we wait on a higher interest rate environment? Maybe, maybe not. You know, I, I think that we're going to see higher interest rates in the next five or ten years, but I don't know. And had you acted on seeing higher interest rates five or ten years ago and not done anything, you would have been in a very sore place. Dividing that up against several different companies, I have no problem with that. However, I think if you find a higher rate, a highly rated carrier and you really look into the financials, it's really not much of an issue. Guys, we got to move along. Brandon, thank you for your call. Arlene up in Auburn, quickly if you could, please. Should one look at market conditions and change withdrawal locations based on that? Arlene, you know, I would be very cautious with that. Now, if you can do that, then great. If you've got it all figured out where the market tops and the market bottoms are, then great. And so when the, the market's down, you should typically be taking those distributions from your taxable accounts because you're generating smaller gains while those equities are down. And when the market's up, you should be taking those distributions from your tax-free accounts or tax-deferred accounts because they're not going to generate any more tax than they would have when they were down because either they've never been taxed or they've already been taxed and they're going to actually come out tax-free. However, if you can figure out the market's tops and the market's bottoms, then it probably really doesn't matter in the first place no. because you've got more money than you know what to do with, and you can take it from any place. However, I don't think that's the case. Most people can't time the market, so what you can do is you can have a plan that is distribution-based and tax-based that fits right into your purpose-based retirement strategy, and using your CPA along with your investment advisor can make that happen. Arlene, have to leave it there. Brandon, Connie, thank you for your calls as well. And if those questions left you with questions, then jump on the phone right now and be one of the next 10 people who call. And we're going to offer a complimentary financial review of your entire financial and retirement plan. It's that opportunity we talk about to get an education about your money because we want you to make the very best decisions for yourself that you possibly can moving forward. So for the next 10 callers, Casey and the team will make time on the calendar, sit down, visit with you, and give you your very own purpose-based retirement. Here is our question of the day. Which financial product offers market participation without a downside risk? Is that a variable annuity, a REIT, bonds, or a fixed index annuity? Casey's got the answer coming up. It's your retirement. How will you live it? How will you be remembered? Will you be able to take me on vacation? Will you be there for my ball game? Will you teach me your values? You'll be able to play with me. Oh, help me go to college. How will I remember you? You need a plan for retirement to create the lifestyle you've always dreamed of. The first step is to tune in to the Purpose Based Retirement Radio Hour with your hosts, Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson, every Saturday morning at 11 and Sunday afternoon at 1 on 1190 WoWo and 107.5 FM. Hey, we left you uh, with a question of the day, and it was, which of these financial products offers participation in the market without any downside risk? Casey, which of those answers is correct? The answer, Lee, is actually D, fixed index annuities. Now, variable annuities are often sold on that, that they say, well, you're going to give upside without any downside. However, variable annuities, by definition, are securities. You can lose your original principal, so there is downside. When it comes to real estate investment trusts, we often hear, well, we're going to put them over here in these real estate investment trusts because it's not going to follow the stock market. However, you can still lose a substantial amount of the principal. When the market goes down, take 2007, for instance, you would have lost over 30% on average in a real estate investment trust. Take bonds, for instance. We often hear bonds touted as a safe place to set aside those investment dollars, but we've seen multi-billion dollar bond defaults in anywhere from municipalities to corporations over even just the last few years. So we can also see massive defaults in a down market. Fixed index annuities are those only places that we're going to be able to set those dollars aside and get the upside of the market with 
none of the downside. Now we're going to have some limits within that. and We're going to go over some rules here today. We're going to talk about how an indexed account works and where that might fit in to your overall investment strategy. So here's the rules of the game. See, I like allegories and, and things like that and analogies. So we're going to talk about this in the frame of mind of, say, a football player. Maybe you're a big football fan. And these are our rules. Rule number one, it's always first down. We like that it's always first down. Number two, we can never lose any yards. Number three, we can only have up to a 12 yard gain per day. So let's follow the game by game play here. The play by play starts at the 20 yard line. So we start at the 20 yard line and we have a 10 yard gain. Now your quarterback is going to throw for a 10 yard gain and the ball gets spotted at the 30 yard line. So we've got a 10 yard gain. We get all 10 yards. We move from the 20 to the 30 and then we have an 18 yard loss. Your quarterback gets sacked at the 12 yard line for an 18 yard loss. But wait a second. We've changed the rules remember so that you can never lose yardage. So where are we? Well we've got no loss no gain even though your quarterback got sacked at the 12 yard line for an 18 yard loss the ball gets spotted back at the 30 yard line where the play began and it's still first down now we have an eight yard gain so the quarterback threw for an eight yard gain and the ball is spotted at the 38 yard line went from the 30 to the 38 yard line and remember it's still first down. Now we have a 19 yard gain. Your quarterback throws for a 19 yard gain, but wait a second. Remember the rules changed. We don't get that whole 18 yard gain. Even though you made that 19 yard play, the 12 yard maximum rule kicks in. So your team has to give back seven of those yards. The result is a gain of 12 yards and the ball gets spotted at the 50 yard line. So what happened now had we played normal Normal rules. We would have seen a 19 yard gain in total. We would have had a gain of 10 yards, 8 yards, and 19, but a loss of 18 would have left us at the 39 yard line. Now, under these new rules, the indexed account rules, we would have seen a 30 yard gain, gains of 10 yards, 8 yards, and 12 yards with no losses, and the ball gets spotted at the 50 yard line. That's an extra 11 yards. And what's this really show us? This shows us exactly what we're always talking about here in the show is that it's not about those big gains. It's not about hitting the home runs in the good years. It's about protecting yourself against a downside, protecting yourself in those bad years. So I get it. It's kind of like having Tom Brady as your quarterback, right? You know something's good. <laughs> right. All right, enough of that. But what, there has to be a downside here, Casey. What's that? What's sure. It? The downside of using a fixed index account is typically that you're going to have restricted gains. That's probably the biggest downside. When we're in a fixed index account, we're going to have a downside, which is that we sometimes tie up our funds. We can mm -hmm. only have 5 10% out every year for a certain period of time. Maybe that's five years, maybe that's 15 years. So we've got limited liquidity and we've also got limited returns. For instance, we could have a 12% limit on our gains every single year, or maybe it's 10% or maybe it's 15%. So we've got limits on our returns. We've tied up our money, but we've got safety. We've got no downside risk and we're getting more upside potential than we would have in a CD or, or something along those lines. Yeah, and that sounds like a good formula. A lot of retirees looking for exactly that. We hope that you've enjoyed the program today. And again, our special offer, if you're one of the next 10 people to call us right now, offering a complimentary financial review of your entire financial and retirement plan. It's an opportunity to get an education about your money so you can make really smart decisions going forward. So next 10 callers, that's the invitation at 482-9559. Casey and the team will make time on the calendar to sit down, meet with you, and give you your very own purpose-based retirement. Again, 482-9559. Thanks for joining us today. We hope that we will see you next time around. Take good care of yourselves. You can always check us out at howardbailey.com. We'll see you next time.